Hello students. So in order to understand a little bit more about cells, we have to understand what's inside of them. And so that's one of our goals in this video. By the end of this video, we should be able to compare the structure and function of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells and of plant and animal cells. So the first things I want you to notice with the success criteria is one of these patterns, something that we see over and over and over again in biology. The idea is the connection between structure and function. Because that's a big idea in biology, it just keeps reappearing. First thing I want to remind us of is cell theory. So we've talked about this a couple times, I just want to review it. So first we know that all organisms are composed of one or more cells. We know cells are the smallest units of life. Anything smaller than that doesn't count as alive on its own. And we know that all cells come from pre-existing cells. There are a bunch of people who are involved in the discovery of those ideas, and I'm not really going to talk about them now um, because we're going to do an activity with them in class, but I just want you to see that there are people behind all these discoveries. Um, in 1665, we have Robert Hooke, who's looking at microscopes, and he's able to see um, like dead cells, but he calls them cells, and from then on, we've been talking about the idea of cell theory is developing over time. Notice it took hundreds of years in order to come up with our most modern version of cell theory. And as we learn more, just as with everything in science, stuff will continue to change. With all those people involved in the idea of uh, cell theory, we have this idea that in order to be alive, there are several things that have to happen. We have to have metabolism, growth, reproduction, response, homeostasis, and nutrition. So when you think about an organism like us that's multicellular, it seems pretty simple to have all of these things. When you break it down, every single cell has to be able to do these, and I think that's pretty cool. So every single cell has to have some sort of chemical reactions occurring within it. They all have to be able to grow at some level. There has to be some sort of reproduction, whether or not that is just um, dividing into asexual reproduction or if that's sexual reproduction. Either way, every organism has to be able to do that. Every organism has to be able to respond to the environment, meaning there has to be somewhere to sense at least some aspect of the environment around it. Every organism, every cell has to do homeostasis, meaning the internal environment is separate from the external environment, and the internal environment can stay balanced. And then every single cell has to have some aspect of nutrition where they can bring in the building blocks that they need and the energy in order to um, create more of themselves. So these things are true for multicellular organisms like us, and they're true for the very simplest bacteria. So that's actually what I want to talk about now is some of the big um, ways that we can organize ourselves. So I really like this image because it shows the relationships between all of life. So these are our three big domains. We have our eukaryotes, there's us over there, the animals. We have our archaea and we have our bacteria. Um, both of these count as prokaryotes. Back here we have our universal ancestor. And so all of these things are related if we go back far enough in time. The part that I really do like about this image is here in the bacteria, it has mitochondria, it has chloroplast. We know that the idea is that these used to be individual organisms on their own that then started to live inside other cells and were the, the precursors for our organelles that are now inside of eukaryotes. And so it's kind of cool to see that connection there. Anyway, all of these different things are going to have lots and lots of different types of cells. But our goal is to find some of the similarities with all of this different diversity. And so first, let's talk about prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. So prokaryotes, um, when I look at this word, I just want to dissect it. Pro means before. Karyotic has to do with karyon, which means kernel, but it refers to the nucleus. And so this just means before nucleus. So prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus. In fact, they don't have any or, um, membrane bound organelles. They do still have things inside of them, but just not organelles as we know them. All prokaryotes are going to be pretty darn small. Um, most are smaller than a micrometer, relatively simple. Um, we do think that they evolved first on, on Earth. Even though they're simple, they still have all of those functions of life happening, and so there still has to be enough inside of them to allow for those things. For that reason, we've got some structures that um, all prokaryotic cells are going to have. They're all going to have a cell wall. Some of them have a capsule. 
all going to have a plasma membrane or a cell membrane. Um, most are going to have flagella or some um, something similar, um, something called pili, ribosomes, and then a nucleoid region. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that their DNA is not in a nucleus. Because it's not in a nucleus, it's not nearly as compact. It doesn't associate with protein. It's just sort of floating in the center. So let's talk a little bit more about each one of these little sections. Um, this right here is an E. coli cell. And often when you're seeing drawings of a prokaryotic cell, you'll see an E. coli cell just because the shape is um, fairly simple to think about the different parts. Different prokaryotic cells are going to look different ways, though. They can be circle, they can be spirals, but they're going to have some of these things in, in common. So the first thing we have is our cell wall and plasma membrane. So cell wall is going to be on the outside, plasma membrane is the next one in. Um, cell wall is going to help protect shape, it's going to allow um, for this thing to be more solid. In bacteria, it's made of a carbohydrate and protein complex, so those two macromolecules working together, called peptidoglycan, which I think is really fun to say. Um, some of them also have an additional layer on the outside of sort of sticky goo. A sticky goo would be a capsule, and that'll allow some prokaryotic cells to stick different places. Um, it's actually why you have to brush your teeth, because that capsule will get bacteria stuck there. Um, then on the inside, you're going to have the cell membrane, and the role of all cell membranes is to control what can go in and what can go out. Um, when this thing is um, doing binary fission, which is the process of um, dividing and sharing DNA, um, that's going to be something that is controlled by the um, cell membrane as well. So what can go in and out? Um, next thing is the pili and the flagella. Um, so they're fairly similar structures, but have very, very different roles. So these pili, these little ones, they're just little hair-like projections, and they are not used for movement. They're just used for bacteria sex. And so they just allow bacteria to hook on to each other, and then bacteria sex is just exchange of little bits of DNA. And so that process um, is done with pili. Then there's flagella, sometimes cilia. Um, those are for cell movement. Next we have our ribosomes. So ribosomes, all ribosomes, are where protein synthesis occurs. So remember proteins do so much in the cell. Ribosomes are where the proteins themselves are made. Um, 70S ribosomes, what that means is prokaryotic cells actually have ribosomes that are a different size than eukaryotic cells. This S is a unit, and the unit is called the Spedberg unit. Um, and what it actually means is the time that it takes to form a pellet in centrifuges. Um, so if you spin something really, really fast, then it'll all go towards the section, and that's called forming a pellet. Um, and that's the way that ribosomes are measured, their, their size. So it's not like a physical distance. It's basically a relationship between size. So just know that 70 is smaller size than 80, for example. Um, and there's going to be two sections to our ribosome, 50S section and a 30S section. And then when they come together, we get to um, 70S, and it's all as a group. So 70S ribosomes are in prokaryotic cells. That's important because a lot of things like antibiotics will work by attacking just ribosomes that are that size. Then we're going to have our nucleoid region. That is going to be our DNA. Um, prokaryotic cells have just one big section of DNA. It's circular. Um, there's not going to be different chromosomes like we have in eukaryotic cells. Um, sometimes there may be additional little bits of DNA that are called plasmids. Um, plasmids are basically one or two genes, just really, really small bits of DNA, um, and they're going to be involved in being shared with other bacteria. So there's where we have our, our DNA. Um, it's important to remember there's no proteins associated with this. Sometimes it's called naked DNA, just sort of floating there in the middle. Last thing I want to talk about really quickly is bacteria sex, because why not? Um, the process is called binary fission. Um, so they're going to divide um, basically through asexual reproduction, where single bacteria is going to just break into two, and they're going to be exactly the same. Um, if they do sexual reproduction, it's called conjugation, 
and they're going to be sharing just little bits of DNA and then dividing into two. They don't have like full sexual reproduction as we do in a lot of eukaryotic cells. They divide primarily through binary fission. Okay, so that's prokaryotic cells. The other group is eukaryotic cells. So what makes eukaryotic cells different is they have organelles. So organelles are going to be these little membrane-bound sections, and they're going to allow compartmentalization to occur. So all the different things that a cell has to do, they can all be separated out, and they can all happen at the same time. Because they can do that, they become much, much more efficient. This prefix U means true. Again, karyotic has to carry on or the kernel. So it just means true nucleus. They have a nucleus. Eukaryotic cells are much larger than prokaryotic cells. And again, they have that section into organelles. Because they have organelles, they're much more efficient. We are um, eukaryotes, meaning we have eukaryotic cells. So are other animals, so are plants, so are our fungus. All those things are eukaryotic cells. Now there's going to be a lot of different organelles inside of eukaryotic cells and they're all going to have different functions and i'm actually not going to talk at you and go through each one of these functions because i just don't think it'll be super helpful um, instead we're going to use a couple of different things to get us there first we're going to look in our um, ib bio book page 20 to 27 so we're going to talk about a lot of these organelles um, one of the best ways i think to look through these is to look at creating some flashcards um, and just write down each one of these 17 different terms. On one side, put the name of it. On the other side, put the function and draw a little picture of what it looks like and then practice with those. Even though I'm not gonna go through each one right now, there's just a couple highlights I wanna point out. The first thing is the ribosome in eukaryotes. So remember in prokaryotes, it was 70S. In eukaryotes, it's 80S, meaning it's a larger ribosome. That's important in distinguishing between the two. Um, also notice there's some of these things that are found in plant cells and not animal cells and vice versa. Um, so just plants and animals are going to have slightly different patterns within the organelles that are in their cells. We'll want to be able to tell the difference between those. Um, notice the nucleus in eukaryotes does have an association with protein. So basically all this DNA is floating around and to get it really compact into a nucleus, protein cells to wind it up, kind of like thread. And so it's going to be really compact that way. That's one way you can tell the difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes is whether or not they have naked DNA or DNA associated with protein. Um, I think that's actually where I'm going to stop in talking about some of these differences. Um, we do want to be able to do some comparisons. And so we should be able to compare prokaryotes and eukaryotes. We'll eventually be able to compare animals and plants. And then you also might want to look at extracellular components. So extra means like in addition or on the outside. So on the outside of cell components, this would basically be the outer wall. Um, so in bacteria, we talked about how that cell wall is peptidoglycan. In fungus, it's going to be a cell wall of chitin. It's actually the same sort of carbohydrate that is in the shells of, of bugs. Um, yeast are going to have cell walls made of gluten and mannan. Algae are going to have cell walls cellulose as do plants. And then us as animals, we don't have a cell wall. We're going to have glycoproteins um, that are going to be on like the outside of our cell membrane, allowing cells to talk to each other. And so one way to do comparisons between different categories of cells is to look at what's on the outside. Um, so hopefully this is helpful in getting a view of some of the diversity of cells and some of the similarities of cells as well.